All right. So we're looking at the Progressive Era. This is a really great political cartoon related to the Progressive Era. Really, this is symbolic of what this is all about. It's the Capitol Titans, the Tycoons, the Robber Barons, battling against labor and the unions with commerce and consumers kind of stuck in the middle and other symbolism, the building up of skyscrapers, the capitalists sort of clad in gold, the railroad cutting through, and then the factories and the tenements beneath the, the laborer. On one of the many periodicals during this era. So what is the era and the roots and the start of the progressive era all about? Keep in mind we've got, sorry about that, large scale immigration during this era, immigrants being processed at Ellis Island and Angel Island, Ellis Island on the east coast in New York, Angel Island on the west coast in San Francisco. 76 million people are going to total the U.S. population at the turn of the century. Really what the progressive movement is all about is a public battle against monopolies, corruption, inefficiency, social injustices, and it's a battle between consumer, a, a fight for consumers and labor against the, the powerful tycoons like J.P. Morgan and Johnny Rockefeller who were at sort of the beck and call um, or Congress was at their beck and call during the era. So the purpose of the progressive era was all about using the government as an agency of human welfare. The progressive roots date back to the Greenback Party, Greenback Labor Party, um, at the end of the Civil War, the Silver Right Movement for Bimetallism, the rise of the Populist Party, labor strikes and riots, um, the March on Washington led by Jacob Coxey and Coxey's, Coxey's army, and some pretty significant populist, socialist, and feminists come, come into the forefront. William Jennings Bryan, your most wide, well-known, and largest sort of ranking populist in this era, He's nominated on the Democratic ticket in the election of 1896. He'll run for president in 1904. He'll run for president in 1908. He'll run for president, uh, or he'll become Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson. So we got William Jennings Bryan. We got Eugene B. Debs, socialist candidate. He becomes leader of the Socialist Party. Ran in elections in 1904, 1908. 1912, 1916, one of which he actually ran for president from jail. Samuel Gompers, leader of the American Federation of Labor. Jane Addams, leader of the Hull House. Willie DeWald, suffragette. Margaret Sanger, suffragette, uh, fighter for the Children's Bureau. And also her more controversial moniker is the uh, female leader of the contraception and um, uh, birth control movement. This is still hotly debated well over a hundred years later. Um, if you've ever heard of Margaret Sanger, you've probably heard her sort of story in either celebration or contempt. Um, a lot of people still see her as like, you know, this social reformer and other people see her as um, you know, the devil's tool, so to speak. So the whole house, a little bit about that. We're all familiar with like the YMCA, W, or YWCA. All right, so um, the whole house is kind of like a YMCA. It's sort of like a place for people to get vocational skills, get meals, have a place to stay, get back up on their feet. It's a community center. That's essentially what the whole house was. It lasted for over 100 years in Chicago. It's a way to get people off the streets and to give them opportunities. The muckrakers in this era were people that 
exposed problems, they exposed corruption, they exposed, there were whistleblowers that exposed major issues in everything from corruption to society. We have that going on today. How many of you guys follow Vice? Anybody watch Vice? Okay, they're investigative journalists. On a more basic level, um, one investigative journalist show that you probably, it, you see every day, Inside Edition, right? With Deborah Norman. Um, they are investigative journalists. Some investigative journalists do a lot better job than others. Um, same was true for this era. The theory of the muckraker actually comes from a phrase from Teddy Roosevelt. Basically, a muckraker was someone that worked in like a horse stable that raked up manure. They raked up the muck. They cleaned up the stable. So what these people are doing is they're digging up dirt on those who were corrupt. So one person that we've already talked about is Jacob Reese. He's the guy that exposed the dumbbell tenements and the filth in the New York tenements in his book, How the Other Half Live and Die in New York. It was like a picture book that showed all of these, like the death and despair and disease and the problems in this era um, in the slums of New York. Theodore Dreiser wrote fiction and nonfiction books like Sister Carrie, The Financier, The Titan, and An American Tragedy, nominated for the Nobel Prize in 1930. Upton Sinclair, one of the more famous works, muckraking works during this era, wrote The Jungle, It Helps Inspire, The Meat Inspection Act, and The Pure Food and Drug Act. What Sinclair does is he's trying to expose a couple of things. The problem that immigrants faced coming to America follows this Lithuanian family coming to America and how they're taking advantage of every turn that they make in America and how the meatpacking industry is widely corrupt and just processing tainted and rotten meat or selling rotten meat, producing tainted meat. Um, Ida Tarbell wrote The History of Standard Oil Company to expose Rockefeller. She was also an educator. Henry D. Lloyd exposed the corruption of Rockefeller as well, and Standard Oil with his book, Wealth Against Commonwealth. And new magazines pop up, Cosmopolitan, Colliers, Everybody's, pretty soon The Atlantic is gonna come on the scene. And I'm sure you all may not pick up paper magazines anymore, you might use your devices. So this would be like sort of like on the liberal stand, stand, standpoint, like Huff Post, Huffington Post, and on the conservative standpoint, like Spectator. Right? So you've got, you have your different um, muckraking magazines to this day. Here's uh, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. And you can actually get this on, if you, I don't know, if you want, ever wanted to buy a paper copy of this, you can get it for like a buck. If you can get it used on Amazon for like a penny. Um, it's free on Kindle or whatever device because it's public domain. So never had any interest in checking it out. Um, so, or you just go to a good old-fashioned library and check it out. Um, so what are some of the goals of the progressive movement? Government controlled by the people at the local, state, federal level, getting away from big-time corporate limited liability and the fact that Congress was controlled by big, big business. Crusade to break up corrupt trusts and monopolies. It started with the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890 during Benjamin Harrison's term in office. It will continue with the Clayton Antitrust Act, which will sure up the loopholes of Sherman, like outlawing price fixing and protecting unions in uh, 19, proposed in 1912, passed in 1913 during Woodrow Wilson's first term in office. Guaranteed economic opportunities through government regulation. So like, I don't care how liberal or conservative we are, or if we're somewhere in the middle, something we could all get behind is opening up a package of food or a can of food and not dying from it, right? I think we can all, we can all stand behind that. So the Pure Food and Drug Act is gonna be inspired by the jungle. And then the elimination of social injustices, like the whole house, or even think about activities we take part in, right? 
like if you are in an honor society or if you are in the do something club or if you are doing volunteer work you in essence are trying to do good to eliminate social injustice that's a legacy that continues this is one of the populist parties political posters bit of a tongue twister in the election of 1892 and the old parties we trusted until financially we are busted down with monopoly ultimately the populists are going to get pulled into the democratic party does anybody remember who our democratic candidate was that is elected to another term and he's our only one to serve non-consecutive terms that's right Grover cleveland good job so he's elected in 1892. also another fun fact Grover cleveland was and still is but it's all in circulation on the one thousand dollar bill um just a heads up so what are some political gains at the local state and at the federal level what well, the local level you've got councils commissions um, that are established so like all of us are impacted by our board of supervisors we're elect we're impacted by town councils we're impacted by school boards we're impacted by parks and recreation these are little commissions that are established during this era um, at the state level there is the initiative the referendum and the recall so the initiative i was talking about i lived in a little community in the museum district back when i was in my late 20s and we needed a four-way stop we were having some bad accidents on the on one of the corners there so we put together a petition we took the initiative and we actually got this four-way stop it was kind of a cool community effort that we did um, quite a few years back not that long ago but feels like a long time ago so initiatives happen all the time like uh, probably about 10 20 years ago maybe it was more like 10 left somewhere between 10 and 20 years ago a student who was um, 18 but in high school in Virginia uh, went missing but because he was not a minor they wanted to wait 24 to 48 hours to start the search and he was found dead so they took an initiative and put it to a vote to change the law that if an 18 year old is goes missing but they're still in high school and they're under the guardian or sort of the roof of their guardians then the, it needs to be treated like what yeah it's kind of like an amber alert right um and you guys can take a look it's it's named after the student or the young guy that this happened to his name was chip and i don't know if it's called it's not a chip alert but it's maybe it's a chip warning so chip warning i mean again that's an example of an initiative referendum uh is when you vote on a proposed measure so like for example um a lot of states in the like the last decade and the district of columbia have had refer referendums or propositions to legalize marijuana so they vote on that through a referendum more locally we have had referendums in the last decade where we'll propose a meals tax and the people vote whether we want it or not or we vote on a bond referendum to build new schools or to build new roads and we vote on it or not so those are just some examples of like a referendum if you got when you guys go to the ballot box some of you will be going to the ballot box very soon um, in this coming up primary uh, in june and you will be voting in the next election cycle in november you very you, there's a pretty good chance that you might have some type of referendum or proposition to vote on and then a recall is like removing someone from public office so if somebody's not doing their job or they are there's widespread corruption they may they might get the boot out of office we saw this happen a lot in the last decade or not the last decade but the last 10 years and that is meaning that at the end of the first decade and the beginning of the second decade of the millennium 
kind of feels like it all just kind of runs together. But when the market crashed in 08, which there's a, that's a trivia question uh, Connery brought up. Today is the day, 10 years ago, where things started to unravel. Because yesterday, 10 years ago, that's when Bear Stern stocks dropped from $130 a share to like 20 and then down to like two, right? It was like plummeting. So, and then today is like the day they started figuring all that out. Well, as the market collapsed, this wasn't overnight, this was a year long progression. Um, the unit, different municipalities were like, hey, we're bankrupt, what happened? And they start taking a paper trail and they figure out, like this woman in Montana, she had completely bankrupted her entire town. She was the mayor of the town, uh, stole all their money. She's now in jail. Uh, the mayor of Miami-Dade County in Florida, he had embezzled like $2 million. And the financial panic like tipped everybody off. So there were a, a large number of recalls during that era. You could also find, if you wanted to search right now, there you could probably find recalls that have happened in the last 12 to 24 months. Um, so why does this happen? Well, graft, corruption. But also keep in mind there are some new things that, if there are some things that at the turn of the century, the 20th century that is, that the federal government does to improve um, their uh, voting laws. Secret ballot in 1892, 1894 has passed. That's something we should not take for granted. The fact that we can go into the ballot box and vote for whoever we want and not tell anybody about it, right? Um, the 17th Amendment. This one is tremendously important. This allows us to have a direct election of our state senators. So the next cycle, Senator Kane will run for re-election against a Republican candidate, maybe a third party candidate for senator, our other senator, Mark Warner. He'll come up, back up for re-election at some point. Remember, they how long do they serve for? Very good, six years. So we directly vote for them now. That's a pretty important thing. They make our laws. Prior to it, they were chosen by the House. That led to widespread corruption. Primary elections. We lived through a primary, right? Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, and Donald Trump and like 15 other people. And as Trump took out his competition, Rubio and uh, Kasich and Ben Carson and um, uh, Jeb, Bush. Jeb Bush, Ted Cruz, he gets the nomination, right, for the Republican Party. Same deal with Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. And that's obviously still a bit controversial um, on how that primary shook out. So one of the earliest urban sprawls in Virginia was the Fan District in Richmond and the North Side that was laid out by one of the most popular city planners at this time, or urban sprawl planners, Louis Genter. That's why the Botanical Garden is named for him. So if you went to the Fan District, it's kind of cool. We're actually, we'll see the Fan District. Monroe Park, VCU, you got Cary Street, you got Monument. You feel like you're going straight, but you're actually fanning out and everything in between is the neighborhood it's gridded out right with their own little communities and they have their own little their little voting districts and their schools and their their own little councils and commissions and um groups and uh homeowners associations and if you if you this right here is where Lee statue sits and you make your way down to Monroe or sorry, not Monroe, but uh, Stewart Circle, where Monument turns into um, Monument turns into uh, West Franklin, and you make your way down to Monroe Park. 
And as you look at those houses past and around VCU, all, as you work your way up toward the fan, all the way up to the boulevard here and beyond the boulevard in the near West End in the museum district, what you will see is that houses built at the turn of the century, and as you move farther and farther west, teens, 20s, this growing urban sprawl at the turn of the century. Really very cool. Um, it's almost like a bit of a bit of a time capsule um, for urban sprawl. Secret ballot. So we got, you know, the vote, the secret ballot. That's very important to us as Americans. Keep in mind, this is also the era where the progressive women come back into the forefront. What do these women try to do? Well, they're trying to get the right to vote. The Civil War had created a bit of a hiccup. Women are going to be stifled by Reconstruction. But in this progressive era, women are going to fight for and gain the right to vote through the passage of the 19th Amendment. Women are also going to fight for the rights of children in the workforce and also for children's rights to get an education through the United States Children's Bureau in 1912. The tragedy of the Triangle Shirtwaist Company fire leads to the establishment of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. The landmark Supreme Court case, Mueller v. Oregon in 1908, these women were represented by attorney Louis Brandeis. He's the first Jewish justice to sit on the Supreme Court, nominated and appointed by Woodrow Wilson. This allows women to gain health care and the eight-hour workday in the labor force and protected by the Constitution. Not all women agreed on this, but this is the resurrection of the temperance movement, the banning of alcohol, led by uh, women like Frances E. Willard, who led the Women's Christians Temperance Union. Remember the Anti-Saloon League? And women like Carrie Nation, the woman that wielded the hatchet to bust up the saloons. Um, and this leads to the passage of the 18th Amendment that prohibited the sale and consumption of alcohol from 1919 to 1933. We'll talk about prohibition during the Roaring Twenties. Uh, really creates a colossal backlash, a lot of organized crime, a lot of lost tax revenue, um, pretty, pretty large-scale nightmare in the progressive era. Some of your key women during this era, Carrie, Cat, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt, that she kind of takes the torch um, from Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth K. Stanton, who are have passed away by this time. Helen Keller, who is remembered for learning how to um, read, talk, and you know, starting in Alabama and then moving to uh, New York and abroad and sort of all over the all over the country. Um, she ends up becoming an advocate for the right to vote, and she ends up becoming one of the female leaders of the socialist movement. Um, and again, women end up gaining the right to vote through the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Here are women celebrating the right to vote after the passage of the 19th Amendment. All right, so Teddy Roosevelt comes charging into office with the plan for the square deal. Now, we haven't talked a lot about McKinley um, since the end of the Gilded Age because McKinley is a big business president, but he's also an imperialistic president. One of the major things that occurs during McKinley's first term is going to be the Spanish-American War. He's also involved in the annexation of Hawaii. We'll get into that in lesson six. We could really like kind of bring the two lessons together, but I find it more important to talk about the progressives before we talk about imperialism. Well, McKinley, you know, he had sort of been put into office and his campaign had been supported by the likes of Morgan and Rockefeller and guys like that. So there was a a uh, young, young man in his 20s who was a um, self-proclaimed anarchist uh, in Buffalo, New York, Leon Shogles, 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 
And um, he is going to approach uh, McKinley and his wife at the Buffalo Pan American <coughs> Exposition with a gun wrapped in a cast, and he will shoot McKinley twice in the abdomen. This allows TR to come into office. McKinley dies a few few days later, um, and TR will launch the Square Deal upon coming into office, where he embraces really sort of like a square deal for labor, consumers, fair competition, and conservation. He focused on the three C's um, in the square deal. Control of the corporations, consumer protection, and conservation of U.S. natural resources. So in 1902, there is a major threat of a coal mining strike. Coal miners on the East Coast won a 20% pay raise and improved conditions in the mines and a, a less of a workday, um, less hours in the workday. The mine owners were not willing to budge on it. So Teddy Roosevelt inserts himself as a the mediator in this uh, collective bargaining. So the collective bargaining agreement is this. Sort of like, imagine me being your boss and you all being my workers and I cut your wages by 35%. You're probably not going to be happy. You might go on strike. So what we're going to end up doing is we're going to bring uh, Dr. Sears in and Dr. Sears is going to become our negotiator for the collective bargaining. You're going to get a little of what you want. I'm going to get a little of what I want. The way that TR uses his leverage is he says, look, if you all don't want to let me come to the table on this thing with you all, I will seize the mines myself and soldiers will work in the mines and the government will control them. This took some pretty big guts, right? This took a lot of, um, a lot of moxie for a president to sort of put labor and put big business on blast. And from that point on, big business knew that TR was not messing around and he was going to come after groups that he felt um, were not good trusts. So collective bargaining, it's the negotiation of wages or other conditions between employment, the employed and the employer. Um, and then we've got a new department, a new uh, cabinet position established in 1903. The Department of Commerce and Labor is going to be formed and it becomes part of the Bureau of Corporations. And this is going to be TR's group, the Department of Commerce and Labor, it's going to determine who are good trusts, who are bad trusts, and they want to do one thing in particular besides trust busting. They want to go in there and fix the problems that were created, or sorry, they want to fix the loopholes that existed in the Interstate Commerce Commission, the ICC, the Regulation of Railroads. And what TR is going to do is he's going to take J.P. Morgan and James J. Hill on head on. He is going to take down the railroad conglomeration. He's also going to take down Standard Oil. And this is a nightmare scenario for the Republican Party. This is not what they want. They, don't, they feel like they're being betrayed by their own president, right? Because he, in, in, in name, is a Republican. I think T.R. kind of transcended that really somewhere in, in between. So regulations on the ICC, we have the Elkins Act that is going to outlaw the rebates and the shippers that accept them. The Hepburn Act restricted the free passes in the railroads. And then the decision on what was good and bad and the scapegoat or the example for the bad trust is going to be the Northern Securities Company that was organized by J.P. Morgan and James J. Hill. In 1904, TR takes them to the Supreme Court and the Northern Securities will be dissolved by, by order of the federal justices on the Supreme Court in a pretty narrow decision. 
TR cracks down on over 40 trusts, anything from beef to sugar to fertilizer to harvester trusts. And then his successor, Taft, busts even more, uh, cracking down on like 90 different trusts in just a four year period. Here's TR taking on Northern Securities, JP Morgan and James J. Hill. Obviously, the muckrakers, guys like Upton Sinclair had inspired TR and other Americans. That leads to the passage of the Meat Inspection Act, meaning that everything that any type of, whether it be pig, sheep, cow, whatever, it's going to be inspected from corral to, to can. Um, scallops. I don't know about scallop regulation. Take a look at that. Shellfish regulation. Um, Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, not only inspires that, but also the Pure Food and Drug Act. Pretty famous quote from Upton Sinclair. I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident, I hit him in the stomach. Um, because what he's trying to do is exploit the plight of the immigrant, but instead, uh, people are way more grossed out by the grotesque um, practices of meatpacking conglomerates like Armour and Swift. What, what's that? It's okay. it's just really <laughs> That's funny. Um, so the meat scandal, remember we talked about the problem of um, these people like processing diseased and tainted meat, uh, vermin, and even in some cases workers falling into vats and being sort of processed with the meat as well. Um, yeah, that was, a, that was, didn't happen all the time, but it happened and it was a problem. So here's a political cartoon of TR and the meat scandal. Conservation was real big. We already talked about the start of the conservation. The Desert Land Act of 1877 with the establishment of Yellowstone National Park by um, Ulysses S. Grant. We also have the Forest Reserve Act of 1891 under Benjamin Harrison and the Billion Dollar Congress. Roosevelt's going to get, um, you know, be persuaded by folks like um, leader of the Sierra Club, John Muir, Gifford Penshow, head of the uh, Division of Forestry, and these massive conservation projects lead to the New Lands Act of 1902 that lead to irrigation projects and dam systems um, like the Roosevelt Dam on the Arizona Salt River. Uh, the conservation of American timber, the establishment of Yosemite National Park, later Sequoia, Literary movements like, you know, folks like Jack London, Call of the Wild. You ever read Call of the Wild? White Fang. Anybody ever read the short story To Build a Fire? Oh man, check that one out. You like that? Um, Baden Powell's Boy Scouts of America. John Muir Sierra Club. Later, the Girl Scouts of America. These organizations lead to large-scale conservation, stewardship, the U.S. Park Service, right? How many people out there have visited a state or a national park, okay? When you went out to that park, did you leave your fire burning? Did you throw trash in the park? No, because we, for generations now, have been handed down this education and stewardship by different organizations, notably the Parks Department, through campaigns like Give a Hoot, Don't Pollute, Only You Can Prevent Forest Fires, right? All of those, those are all important campaigns to ingrain that into our system, right? My oldest daughter even looked at our youngest daughter and she threw a wrapper down and my oldest daughter's like, we do not litter and pick up the trash. They're not, they're five and two, right? So I don't, I didn't know that we were handing that down already, but we are. And 
and like unconsciously handing that down to our to our children. Um, interesting character, Horace Kephart, author of Our Southern Highlanders and Camping and Woodcraft. Has anybody heard of Horace Kephart? Maybe one of the more interesting characters um, in this particular. Him and John Muir, quite interesting. Kephart was an Ivy League librarian, had a family, and then just bugged out, decided he needed to live in Appalachia among the people of the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina to see how they lived and what their process of conservation was. He was sorely disappointed. These people were like totally taking out all their natural resources using sticks of dynamite to fish with as bad news. So he becomes like sort of like an educator in conservation and he leads the Smoky Mountain National Park. He leads that movement. That's the reason that we have the Smoky Mountain National Parks and it is the most visited national park in America. I don't know if you realize that. Well worth your time. I highly recommend you visit a national park, whether it be Shenandoah or the Great Smoky Mountains or Yellowstone or Yosemite. Get out there, check it out. It'll blow your mind. It'll change your life. Um, Kephart, though, uh, you know, he's living in this little shanty shack type cabin on the border of North Carolina and um, Tennessee. Got, uh, got into the moonshine a little too hard um, in his time there. Ended up uh, in a, got into a really bad car accident in the 19 teens in Appalachia uh, due to a drunken driving accident. So I don't know if you've driven the roads in the Smoky Mountains now. Can't imagine what they looked like 100 years ago. Um, so here we have Teddy Roosevelt, John Muir. Um, Muir's one of these guys, pretty wild guy too. Uh, during a windstorm in Yosemite, he would climb to the tallest tree he could find to see how the tree felt in the wind. Uh, he would jump and try to ride ride out um, avalanches to see how it felt to be part of an avalanche. He's a very interesting character. He did not die from any of that. He actually died of pneumonia. Here he is at Yosemite. Yeah. So TR has to deal with yet another financial panic. Remember these panics are anywhere from 10 to 20 years apart. So the last major panic we had learned about was the Panic of 1894. This particular panic, guess who he has to appeal to? Yet again, J.P. Morgan. Morgan's going to trade out gold for what? Bonds, more bonds, and going to keep getting wealthy, but Morgan's not too far from death. He's going to pass away in 1910. Congress in 1908 was going to pass the Aldrich Vreeland Act, um, which actually sets a pretty long-standing precedent that banks could issue emergency currency backed by various kinds of collateral. We still use that tradition today. Our, our dollar backs is backed by a numerous numerous commodities. This opens up the door to the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. This is part of Woodrow Wilson's new freedom plan and that new freedom plan leads to the establishment of the Federal Reserve to create economic stability and one of those Federal Reserve banks winds up right here, right here in Virginia where? In Richmond. Yeah. Good. If you have a teddy bear in your house, sure everyone has one. Okay, your teddy bear comes from a hunt that Teddy Roosevelt, he was a big time hunter. Um, Roosevelt went on a hunt in uh, Mississippi only to find out that the bear that he was supposed to be hunting uh, had been, um, was a young bear, not living in captivity, but also not living in the wild. Yeah, 
Yeah, so he refused to shoot the bear because he didn't believe that that was the way a sportsman should hunt. And the crest picked it up, and we, get, we got the teddy bear up. So this is where we're going to pump the brakes today. The Rough Rider thunders out. He does not run for re-election. His hand-picked successor, William Howard Taft, will defeat both William Jennings Bryan and Eugene B. Debs. But here's the problem. Taft is going to have to deal with the enormous shadow cast by TR. This is one of my favorite political cartoons of the era. TR as Little Bo Peep and Taft as his sheath. The bell, TR around the neck. Let's pay attention here. The staff is what is called the big stick policy that Roosevelt lived by. Speak softly, carry a big stick. The prod on the end, my policies. And Taft is an oversized sheep here because he put on a lot of weight in public office and as president, he got himself stuck in a bathtub. So they had to change the White House bathtub to fit Taft, but in Taft's defense, Taft's defense, he comes out of the office of the president, he gets his dream job, an appointment to the Supreme Court, and the man loses between 60 and 80 pounds. He slims down, he gets in shape, and he really, he ends up, you know, he hates the presidency, but he loved his position uh, on the courts. So we'll pick up where we left off next class. Did you guys have any questions?